If Bitcoin ruled the world, then the electricity used by the network's miners would be far less than that currently used to power the world's financial system, according to Bitcoin supporters. But until we get there, ways to reduce the power consumption of miners are welcome. This week we're hearing about an ingenious idea that combines Victorian technology, thousands of computers and the growing of vegetables. It's all happening in Canada, under the supervision of my guest, Laurie Trevor Deutsch of United Corps. So whether you're interested in Bitcoin, growing tomatoes, or how to stay cool in a low-tech way, this one's for you. You're listening to Coin Deep Conversations with Charles Miller. So Laurie, thank you very much for doing Coin Geek Conversations. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, blockchain domes. This is a really interesting idea, uh, and it's a very physical idea in a world of sort of technology which is often rather non-physical. For those of people who haven't heard anything about it, give us the sort of beginner's guide to, to blockchain domes. Well, I, th I think you've hit the nail on the head here. Uh, this is something that we essentially started from scratch. Our company is originally out of the telecommunications and data center business. That was our business. And I confess to you, I knew nothing about blockchain two years ago. Bitcoin was something, like everybody else, you hear about it, you think about it, but you don't really know much about it. And you may not think, may not hear good things about it either. <laughs> and there's a little bit of suspicion around it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but around two years ago, uh, when my partner and I were brainstorming uh, as to where we should bring the business, uh, we felt that telecommunications really was a, a very um, uh, stable business. It had run its course and we needed to look at something a little bit newer and more exciting and modern. So we started to look at, at the whole blockchain aspect. There were a lot of articles about, particularly with respect to the green aspects of blockchain mining. The fact that uh, blockchain, Bitcoin was consuming, I read one article that said that a year of Bitcoin mining consumed as much electricity as the entire country of Ireland. And I thought this is very, very odd. But at the same time, we thought there must be an opportunity here. What can we do to make mining more efficient? And as we started to plunge into it, we did learn the obvious that a great portion of the mining uh, costs are related to air conditioning, cooling and air conditioning. Up to 20-25% of costs of mining operations are cooling. So my partner said, well, maybe we shouldn't be looking at air conditioning. Let's look at what else there is out there. And he uncovered a fairly old technology called a Canadian well. And the Canadian well was something that was actually invented in the 1800s and it was used for cooling houses. Very simple technology where um, somebody would dig a trench, dig a pipe, put it, a subterranean pipe, and would, through the chimney effect that's created in a house, would actually draw air up through the house and it would suck cool air from the pipe. The air would enter at one end, would be cooled underground, and then would come up uh, dehumidified and cooled. So he said, let's let's see, maybe we can use that for mining because um, the miners use a lot of air, they need dehumidified air, and they need cool air. So, so was this something that was a technology used by the sort of settlers in Canada or I something? I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. It's, it's called a Canadian well. Uh, frankly, I don't know what the history is mm. or where the origin of the name comes from, but the technology is very simple and very sound. So right, so the Canadian well can bring a sort of efficient, low-tech contribution to reducing the energy requirement for mining. Correct, correct. So we had a property, we had a property in Quebec, which was actually an agricultural property, and it had, uh, at the time, a dome, an equestrian dome. These domes are very common all through Quebec, and they're essentially very high-tech fabric um, domes, and they can be built very quickly. And what are they for? They're there for any, they can be for storage, they can be for a barn, they can, they're typically on farms in Quebec and they are very large and very weather resistant. But something to do with horses, presumably? Well, in this case it was an equestrian center. It was used, oh, I see. It was used for horses to train horses, for dressage. Oh, right, okay. Uh, but hadn't been used in a number of years. Hmm. So we took the elements of what we had, which was land, access to electricity, and a dome. And uh, my partner came up with this concept of a blockchain dome. And the blockchain domes are very simply Canadian wells that have been industrialized to be used for blockchain mining. And that's the genesis of the idea. But very simple. So 
the complicated part of it, I would have thought, would be getting the mining side of it working. How did you tackle that? Well, the, mi the mining is easy because is <laughs> we don't do the mining. We have oh. clients that do the mining. But we you still need to get all the kits service. and make it work and everything. Well, what we did, the hardest part was actually getting the power. The power infrastructure is the most expensive and the most time consuming. But we happen to be near a substation and we happen to be working with a um, electrical co-op in Quebec. In Quebec, there are two ways you can get your power. One is through Hydro-Quebec, which is the government-owned main energy supplier. And certain communities in the province also have cooperatives. They buy from Hydro-Quebec and they resell to their local communities as a cooperative. So the co-op being a lot more flexible than Hydro-Quebec said, this is a very intriguing idea. We, um, we've maxed out our uh, industrial clients and uh, this is potentially very good for us and we'll work with you to develop the electrical infrastructure for your domes. And so, so they basically had cheap power that they, want, they needed to sell. That's right. They had cheap power, which is the norm in Quebec. Quebec has cheap power, has a mm. lot of cheap power. Because mm. it's w w hydroelectric. It's all hydroelectric. Yeah. And they have a lot of it. They have a lot of, they somewhere of 900, 900 million megawatts. They have a lot of extra power. They <laughs> have a lot, lot of kettles. Power. They have a lot of power. So we worked with the co-op. They developed the electrical infrastructure and we developed the physical infrastructure mm -hmm. for it, which means uh, developing technology to trench out for these, um, for these Canadian wells and to develop uh, a mounting system for the miners. The, the interesting thing about miners is that they have a straight air flow through system. Now when, we just, when we're talking about miners here, we're talking about computers, not people. We're talking about computers. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. So these You're not standing a whole lot of people on little pedestals. No, but, uh, <laughs> but, we, but we use a lot of people to set up the miners. Right. That's, that's for sure. So we were responsible for setting up the physical infrastructure and doing the, the engineering. And um, what my partner came up was, with was the idea of mounting miners on a proprietary um, docking station. Uh, uh, each miner sits on its own pipe, on its own air supply. That air supply is supplied from outside the dome, about 150 feet away from the dome, is the air intake. So the miners having a, a laminar flow system, essentially the ant miners have two fans. We can mount these on pipes. The fans draw cold air up, they expel the hot air out, and at the same time, the enhanced effect of the chimney effect of hot air rising means that you have a negative pressure in the dome itself. That negative pressure creates the suction that you need to draw the, cool, the air in from outside. It goes below grade, it's cooled, it's dehumidified, and it comes up into the miner. So, so what, sort of, um, what sort of scale were you working on to start with then? How many miners were we talking about? To start with, we were looking at dome of a thousand miners. Right, so that's like you had to buy a thousand computers. We had to, we worked with a partner uh, who was interested in setting up a mining facility. And they supplied the miner. We're a hosting facility. We don't own the miners. We don't oh, actually okay. do the mining. We provide the hosting services. Right, so you find a tenant for we your find dome. A tenant. Exactly, we found a tenant who was intrigued by the mm. concept. It's not an easy s concept to sell. It was brand new. A lot of people told us it wouldn't work. The engineers told us it wouldn't work. Uh, a lot of people in the industry said it couldn't work um, and thereby set us up for the challenge. <laughs> and if you know my partner, you, will, you would understand that every time you tell him he can't do something, ultimately that gives him the incentive to do it. <laughs> okay. so. What sort of um, efficiency were you able to achieve with the system then? Well, the efficiency is that, in essence, the only power that's required to operate the miners to mine is the power required to operate the miners. So no cooling There's power. no cooling. There's no electromechanical venting. Um, there's nothing. It's just mm. plug in the miners and let them work. So I think that's as close to a one-to-one -one efficiency as you're going to get. And as, as you said, the, mi the normal cooling would take, what, 20, did you say 25%? Typically, percent? our understanding is it's 20 to 25% of the yeah. cost is in cooling, depending on the climate. Now, Canada can be either quite cold or it can actually be quite hot. In the last two years uh, during operations, we've had record uh, summer temperatures of over 40, 45 degrees with 80% humidity. This is typically death for miners. Unless you have mm. a really solid cooling system, 
um, it's going to cost you a lot to cool. And it costs us nothing to cool, summer or and, winter. And you didn't find there was a certain temperature beyond which you needed to bring in supplementary cooling? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, the beauty of a subterranean cooling system is the earth is actually coolest in the summer and warmest in the winter because there's a lag. Oh, I see because right. in winter the earth below is constantly cooling, mm. cooling, cooling, cooling. It reaches its depth of about 8 degrees and as summer comes it's only then very slowly starting to heat. So we actually get the coolest air coming in in the summer hmm. and warmer air in the winter. But it's it's counterintuitive. I mean, why don't people just use this to cool their houses then? Some people do. And, and what, it, I mean, it's not a common thing. First of all, you need a lot of land. You do need that oh, you long need the stretch. Pipe length. Yes. Now, a lot of people have a just a right. So just a normal sort of back garden wouldn't. A normal. It, it, you need a length. You need a you need a run, and I think you need the desire to do it. Uh, uh, there's geothermal cooling systems that are available. They tend to go down rather than lateral. And so see, they go yeah. deep, and they typically use water when the water is available. And that costs more. And it costs more. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the, the added bonus here, because we really are going... I, I have a sustainable development background. I'm actually a bi biologist. I'm not, I'm, hmm. I'm not a technical person uh, with a very keen interest in sustainable development. So we have lower power consumption because we've reduced the cooling. Uh, and we have a, essentially a zero carbon source of electricity through hydro. And at the same time, we're taking the hot air because it's still the miners produce hot air. And we're recirculating that hot air into greenhouses. And that allows us to essentially have a full circle of energy. And uh, it means that we can grow crops in winter that could mm -hmm. not normally be grown. And even in summer, the hot dry air is used in what's called a power, um, a positive pressure greenhouse environment and what you do in a positive pressure greenhouse is you keep the greenhouse in a pressure environment with air hot cool uh, hot dry air flowing by the plants which does two things it eliminates insects because the insects can't flow against the, the pressure and it reduces um, f mold and fungus from dew and then the pressure is simply the rising heat in the dome it, so in the dome and it's pumped into mm. uh, through very small little motors pumped into the greenhouses right so you can create an orga or a fully organic environment without pesticides or fungicides because you've eliminated the pests mm. and you've eliminated the conditions for mold and but fungus but you're not actually in the farming business we're not you? no no we're you, not you, again so you rent that greenhouse exactly so exactly it's, so it's, it's, it's a third party we let we let people do what they do best so we're not miners we yeah. let miners mine. We let farmers farm. So, so, so basically you're creating two different linked environments and selling them to separate customers because of the particular qualities that they each have. That's right. And you have a synergy of operations because you're lowering the cost of operations for both. But you're essentially cross-subsidizing. The, um, the heat produced by the mining is normally waste. So we can use that heat for agricultural operations we can we can sell heat at a reduced price because essentially we're not paying for it and we can cross subsidize the cost of electricity through the heat that's being sold mm. so it really is a win-win situation and at the same time we're creating a much better um, environment uh, socially and uh, for uh, sustainability because it's creating some jobs it's creating jobs and it's reducing carbon footprint there is mm. almost no carbon footprint with this operation whatsoever so this is sort of you know the Bitcoin that is mined out of your well it's it, that has a carbon footprint doesn't it because you are still using power but we're using but we're using low carbon power because it's it's oh, hydro. I see, yes right. so it's not coming from a coal plant it's not coming from natural gas mm. so you could almost describe this as organic Bitcoin we're hoping yeah <laughs> I, I hadn't really thought of it as organic Bitcoin but but certainly it is a, um, a, a greener way to, to mm. mine. Mm. And we think a lot of the criticism um, on blockchain in general has been over its power consumption. Yeah, of course. Well, so now how, how far have you got with the business and growing it? And well, we've got 6,000 miners up and running. Uh, we are uh, moving to um, two other properties that we've considered. Uh, which we hope will be launched within the next year. And we've just started a project 
uh, near Brahornois, Quebec, which is just outside of Montreal, for a 40 megawatt facility using the same technology, not necessarily for mining, but for traditional data centers, because this is a technology which ports itself very nicely to mm. traditional data centers. So, so do you have any particular relationship with Bitcoin SV or just happen to be interested in it? We happen to be interested. I think that uh, Bitcoin SV uh, is a group that uh, they've certainly recognized our technology. They've mm. been very supportive. Um, and, uh, but we are, we're a hoster. Yeah, we, don't, yeah. we don't support, we don't know what our clients are mining. And frankly, it's not up to us to know what our clients are mining. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And so do you see big scope for expanding this business across Canada and across other countries maybe? We, th we think that it has a lot of potential because uh, one of the things that we can do is we can bring our domes to where the power is rather than having to bring the power to where the domes are. So if we know that there's a particular substation uh, in a rural area that has excess power, we can build there. Mm. Uh, it, it's almost counterintuitive where a lot of the mining operations look for a building first and then they will see, is there enough power? Uh, can I zone it? Can I do this? Rather than, this is where the opportunity is, we will take the mining to the opportunity. I mean, do you have any protection for this idea or could anybody just start doing we this? We have a patent in, we have patent pending in. For which bit uh, for of it? The, for the whole, the whole process. Oh it right. is a process patent. Yeah. And it was filed in January 2017. Right. And how many people do you have in the business at the moment? We have 25 people working and that's combined with the, uh, the dome operation and our uh, telecom operation right, as well. I see. Well, it's fantastic and I'm sure lots of people who are worried about the environmental effects will be really, really excited to hear about this. I, I think so. I think um, you look at companies like Amazon, um, this is a natural for them mm. because they need the data centers. They own Whole Foods. They're trying to reduce their carbon yeah. footprint. There's a perfect example. They could have their data centers. They could feed their organic requirements mm. through the greenhouses and they've done it in a low carbon environment. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of those big com big tech companies they do and do try and locate their data centers in renewable energy locations, mm -hmm. but you're taking it one step further than that. Exactly. Um, to 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 me get more value out of being in those locations. Yes. Yes. I th we're trying our best to really um, uh, be environmentally friendly and make money at the same time. What's not to like? Exactly. <laughs> Laurie, exactly. thank you very much indeed. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks very much to Laurie Trevor Deutsch. Do please subscribe to CoinGeek Conversations on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't miss next week's show, which is a festive special, looking back on the highlights of 2019. Until then, goodbye from me, Charles Miller. <laughs>